in a couple of days from now, there will be a solar eclipse in the United States that will happen on October 14, 2023. This solar eclipse is going to be an annular solar eclipse, and six months later, we are going to have another solar eclipse that will be this time total on April 8, 2024. The math behind the science of solar eclipse is interesting and has something to do with the Ceros cycle. The Ceros cycle predicts that every 18 years, 11 days and 8 hours, you will have a new solar eclipse that will share very similar features with the previous one. But how exactly did we come up with this number of 18 years and so on? And what does it have to do with the way the Moon is orbiting Earth? This is what we're going to explore in this video. So, to understand the Ceros cycle, we have to understand the three orbital periods of the Moon. The first orbital period of the Moon is called the synodic month. To understand the synodic month, we have to check the position of the Sun, Earth and the Moon as projected on the ecliptic plane. And what we are calling the ecliptic plane here is the plane in which the Earth is orbiting around the Sun. So if we are looking at the position of the Sun, the Earth and the Moon from above this ecliptic plane, we can see that the synodic month is completed every time the Moon goes back exactly in between the Sun and the Earth. And that makes sense, right? Like, if the Moon was not located exactly in between the Sun and the Earth, then the Moon would not be able to block the sunlight and we will not see a solar eclipse. The synodic month is actually the duration between two consecutive new moons and is equal to 25.530589 days, which is approximately equal to 29 days, 12 hours, 44 minutes and 3 seconds. Now, the next important orbital period is called the Draconic Month. And to understand this one, we have to change our point of view. Instead of looking at the Sun, the Earth and the Moon from above the ecliptic plane, we are going to switch our point of view and look at these three bodies from inside the ecliptic plane. When you take this point of view, you realize that the orbital plane of the Moon around Earth is not exactly the same as the orbital plane of the Earth around the Sun. The orbital plane of the Moon is actually inclined about 5.14 degrees with respect to the ecliptic plane. And because of this, even if you think that the Sun, the Moon and the Earth are aligned by looking from above the ecliptic plane, they are not necessarily aligned in practice because of this slight inclination. To be truly aligned between the Sun and the Earth, the Moon needs also to be inside the ecliptic plane and the Moon is truly inside the ecliptic plane in two points of its orbit that we call nodes. And what we call the draconic month is actually the time it takes for the Moon to go back to one of its nodes. In average, this draconic month, also called node to node, is approximately equal to 25.212221 days, which is approximately equal to 27 days, 5 hours, 5 minutes, and 36 seconds. And finally, the third orbital period to take into account is called the anomalistic month and is basically the duration between each consecutive perigee. What we call the perigee is actually the smallest distance between the Earth and the Moon. You see, the orbit of the Moon around the Earth is not a perfect cycle. The orbit of the Moon around the Earth is actually an ellipse and the Earth is in a focus of that ellipse. The perigee is the distance between the Moon and the Earth when the Moon is at this location on the orbit, and the apogee is the distance between the Moon and the Earth when the Moon is at this location of the orbit. This is actually what is making the difference between a total solar eclipse and an annular solar eclipse. As you may know, in October 2023, we will have an annular solar eclipse, and this is because the Moon will be further away from the Earth and will be blocking less of the sunlight. On the contrary, in April, we will have a total solar eclipse, and this is because the Moon will be closer to the Earth and will be closer to its perigee. And this duration, the anomalistic month, is equal to 
27.554550 days, which is approximately equal to 27 days, 13 hours, 18 minutes, and 33 seconds. So now you understand that to experience the same solar eclipse on Earth, three things need to happen at the same time. First, the Moon needs to be aligned in between the Sun and the Earth, at least from the point of view above the ecliptic plan. Second, the Moon needs to be truly aligned between the Earth and the Sun, and for this the Moon needs to reach its node, which occurs every draconic month. And finally, to block the same amount of sunlight, the Moon needs to be at the same distance of the Earth, which happen every anomalistic month. And so when these three events happen simultaneously again, you're having the same type of eclipse that you were having before. And it has actually been calculated that these three events simultaneously occur every Saros cycle, which is approximately equal to 18 years, 11 days and 8 hours. But so how did we come up with this number? How can we actually verify that this is the actual duration between each time that these three events simultaneously occurred? So in the description of this video, I am providing the link of a NASA website that describes this Saros cycle. And what you can see is that if you are taking 223 synodic months, you are having 6585 days with 7 hours and 43 minutes. If you take 239 anomalistic months, you are having 6585 days, 12 hours and 54 minutes. And 242 draconic months make 6585 days, 8 hours and 35 minutes. So as you can see, all these durations are pretty close to one another and they all correspond to a whole number of synodic month, anomalistic month and draconic month. So what that means is that after 6585 days and more or less 8 hours, you would have the moon that will go back to the same position in between the sun and the earth and also will be back to one of its nodes, which will guarantee that it will be truly aligned between the Sun and the Earth. You can see, however, that for the anomalistic month, we are still 4 hours away from it, and that means that the Moon will not be exactly at the same distance from Earth as it was during the previous Saros cycle, but that's okay because it's only a 4 hours difference on a 27.5 days period, so the distance is not going to be really different, and at least you have this true alignment between the Sun, the Moon and the Earth that is truly repeated. And so you can verify this calculation yourself with a simple calculator, but the problem is that it doesn't really answer our question about how did people come up with that number and how can we be sure that it is the shortest duration for all events to simultaneously occur. Well, to answer this question, we can have an element of response in arithmetic and number theory, and more specifically with the concept of least common multiple. So if you remember your number theory or arithmetic class, you may remember that the least common multiple of, let's say, three numbers P, Q and R, if this number is equal to N, then we know that N is the smallest integer such that P divide N, Q divide N and R divide N as well. And now let's imagine that the synodic month, the anomalistic month and the draconic month were all made of a whole number of days, then the Saro cycle will be easy to calculate. You will simply have to take the least common multiple of these three periods of time. And let's say that we call TS for the time period of the Saro cycle, the least common multiple of uh, TA, TB and TC where A, B and C are the three different events, then if we call TS the least common multiple of TA, TB and TC, then TS would be exactly the period of the Saros cycle. And this is because TA divide TS, TB divide TS and TC divide TS. And because TS is the least common multiple, by definition, this is the smallest integer that verifies that, 
and so it means that it is the smallest number of days required for all events to simultaneously occur again. So, of course, that would work if the moon's orbital periods were a whole number of days or hours or whatever, but unfortunately this is not the case. TA, TB and TC are not whole numbers here, so it is not possible to use the least common multiple, so we have to find another method. So instead, the trick that we are going to be using here is to measure, at a certain time t, how close we are from the end of each cycle. So to understand what we will be trying to do here, let's take into account like one type of orbital month that has a duration big T, and let's represent a graph in which we represent the time on the x axis and the distance from the nearest cycle end on the y axis. So as you can see here, we write big T, 2T, 3T, and the curve that we will be drawing is basically the distance from the nearest cycle. So when we start at t equals 0, we assume that we are already at the beginning of the cycle, so we are at a distance 0. When we are at t over 2, we are at a distance exactly t over 2 from the nearest cycle, because we are at the same distance from t equals 0 and the distance from t equals big T. When we get closer to the time big T, then we are at a distance 0 from the nearest cycle end, and then we go back and forth and back and forth. So the question now is that how do we get this function? How can we find a way to plot this function and use this function? What we can start doing is to uh, write the function round of x. And the function round of x is basically defined as the closest integer of x whether it's uh, on the left side or on the right side. So we can basically write round of x using the step function. This function is equal to the nearest left side integer. But if you add one half in the step function and you use instead the step function of x plus one half, you will have exactly the function round of x. So let's say if you evaluate this function is 5.4, you will have the number 5. And if you evaluate this function in 5.6, then you will have the number 6. Okay, that's a good start. But we are not really interested to know what is the nearest integer. What we want to know is the distance that we are from the nearest integer. Now that you have the function round of x, what you have to do is to subtract round of x from the variable x. So you can write x minus step function of x plus one half. And if you plot this function on a graph, what you see is that you have this little discontinued diagonal path that all cross a whole number at y equals zero and are basically describing a sort of distance from this whole number. But it's not really a distance because sometimes we are negative and sometimes we are positive. But that's okay, to make it a distance, the only thing that we have to do is to take the absolute value of this quantity, and here we go. What we are having right now is exactly the distance of the variable x to its nearest integer. Okay, we're almost there, and this obviously works if we assume that big T is equal to 1. But we want it to work for any value of big T, so how do we do that? So the idea that we have to use here is to expand the curve that we have obtained below both in the x and in the y axis. And to do that, the trick that we have to use is to simply transform the y value into t multiplied by y and the x value into x divided by t. So the general distance function becomes f of x is equal to big T multiplied by the absolute value of x over t minus the step function of x over t plus one half. And we can simplify that as being equal to the absolute value of x minus big T, step function of x over t plus one half. So let's define this function in Python and make sure that it works. So as you can see, when we are showing the graph here, you can see that this is exactly the function that we were expecting to have. So at any point in time, what this function is showing is exactly the distance to the nearest cycle end of a cycle of period big T. And now that we have defined the general function for any 
orbital period big T, we can define this function for the synodic month, the anomalistic month, and the draconic month. And so let's call these three functions f t a of t, f t b of t, and f t c of t. So according to the way we have uh, defined this function, you can see that we assume for all of these functions that at t equals zero, we are already at the end of an orbital month and we want to know when is the next time that we will reach the end or we are close to the end of the same type of orbital month. So now we know that a similar eclipse will occur at a time t if fta of t, ftb of t and ftc of t are all close to zero at the same time. So in other words, if the vector f composed of fta, ftb and ftc, if this vector is close to zero. What does that mean for a three-dimensional vector to be close to zero? Well, in that case, what you have to do is to take any kind of norm you want. So for example, you can use the what is called the infinite norm that is basically calculating max of fta, ftb and ftc. But you can also perfectly use the one norm that is equal to fta plus ftb plus ftc. So in our case, arbitrarily, we are going to use the infinite norm and calculate the max between those three quantities. And from there, what we are going to do is to calculate this maximum distance for all hours within a very long period composed of many, many years. So let's say just for fun that we are going to take one million hours. So how many years are there in one million hours? Well, the easy way to calculate that is to divide 1 million by 365.25, which is more or less the average number of days in a year, and to divide again that number by 24. And the result that you get is approximately 114 years. So I think we are pretty good there. And now what we're going to do is to calculate this max of FTA, FTB and FTC for all this 1 million number. Okay, let's do that. And now let's plot the graph. So as you can see, this graph is very noisy, although we can see some kind of periodicity happening there. But what we want to know is when exactly are we reaching the minimum value? We can perfectly ask Python to calculate the minimum for us and the position of this minimum. So if we omit, let's say the first 24 hours, and we ask Python to find the position of the minimum after these 24 hours, what we find is that the position of the minimum is equal to 158,050 hours. And if you divide this number by 24, what you obtain is 6,585 days plus more or less 10 hours. Does that remind you of something? Yes, that's exactly the number of days of the source cycle. So we see here that we are not exactly at 8 hours, but that's normal, it's because the 8 hours kind of disregard the anomalistic month a tiny bit. So we are kind of in between the 7, 8 and 12 hours of the 3 orbital month. So this is how to find the periodicity of the Saros cycle. You have to find the time t after a certain period of time that minimize the distance to the cycle end of the 3 orbital period simultaneously. And here, of course, we were cheating a little bit because instead of finding it for any time t, we were using discrete time period of length one hour. And if by any chance you know about another method that helped to find the exact solution with a continuous time t, please let me know in the comment. I would be very curious to know about it. That's it for me today. I hope that you enjoyed this video and if by any chance you will be in the path of the eclipse for this 2-1 or maybe the future one, I hope you will enjoy it as well.